In today's activity, we're going to attempt to verify the thin lens equation. You know that equation, 1 over f is equal to 1 over do plus 1 over di. So of course, the problem, always phrased in the form of a question, is the thin lens equation valid for a particular converging lens? We say for a particular converging lens because you're going to test it with one convex or converging lens. You're not going to test it with every lens. And in the end, we're doing a bunch of them as a class, but you are drawing your conclusion based on your data, not based on group data. So you're going to verify it for, or at least attempt to verify it, for one converging lens. You, of course, have to identify, in this case, variables. One manipulated variable. You'll see what that is as we go through the procedure. It'll become quite clear to you, I think. Also, one responding variable that should become quite clear to you as well. And then control variables. There's a thousand control variables, but as we always say, there's usually one or two really, really important control variables. Those are the ones we want mentioned. If you happen to mention some other ones, that's great, but not necessarily necessary. Okay, what's necessary, what's critical, is you identify the ones that we absolutely cannot change, otherwise everything gets messed up. Now, you're going to have to, in your final product, uh, your final write-up, give me the problem, which I've already given you. You're going to have to give me the variables. You're not going to have to include the materials. Yeah, I'm just listing those here so that it makes a little bit of sense to you as we go through this procedure here. You need to uh, have what's called an optics bench apparatus. The optics bench apparatus includes a meter stick. It also includes a candle. The candle, by the way, is going to serve as our object. The reason we use a candle as our object is because it generates its own light, and therefore it ends up being more light than just using, say, a pencil as our object, reflecting light. Okay, we want something that's bright, brighter than everything else around it, and the candle serves nicely for that. Now, in addition to the candle, you've got a little holder that the candle's in that attaches it to the meter stick. You've also got a screen, which is really just a piece of cardboard, white cardboard, that is attached to the meter stick by, once again, a holder. You've got a lens holder as well, and inside that lens holder, you've got a converging lens. Finally, you've got a meter stick holder, and there's another one that's not pictured here, down here, another meter stick holder. That's just so that you don't have to hold the meter stick in your hands as you're performing this experiment. Does that make sense? So that's what the apparatus looks like. Now I'm going to erase all this so I can tell you exactly what the procedure is going to be. What I want you to do is, first of all, uh, find the focal length of the lens. Right, Cameron? Find the focal length of the lens. And you might remember last week uh, we did a little demonstration with a Canada flag on the smart board as to how to find the focal length of the lens. We want to focus not on something that's that close, though. We want to focus on something far off. The condos across the street. Um, if you go down to the end of the hallway here to find the focal length of your lens, there's some trees on the other side of the football field that you can focus on. The bottom line is you want to focus on something that is fairly far off and in bright sunlight. Now, you want to be in as dark of area as possible so that the ambient light doesn't wash out your image onto your card. So focus, when you're in an area that's fairly dark, focus on something outside, far away, that is reflecting lots of light, like the condos across the street or the trees across the football field, and then move your card back and forth until you see a good focused image. Now, when you do, the distance between the lens and your image should be your focal length. And that's likely going to be, depending upon your lens, likely going to be in the range of 10 to 20 centimeters. There's a few of the lenses that we have that are outside of that range by a bit. But I'll tell you, if you're looking at the 50 centimeter range, you're not going to find it because okay? it's, not, it's not that big. We had one in the other class, I think, that was 6 centimeters. Um, most of the lenses are in the range of 10 to, 10 to 15, 10 to 20 centimeters. So start looking in that range at least first. Remember, be in a dark area, but aim your lens at a bright area, at an, a bright object somewhere outside. All right? If you have trouble with that, then just let me know. So you're going to record that value of the focal length, whatever that value happens to be, in centimeters. Then you're going to, here's our same pictures we had on the previous page. Then you're going to actually start the main part of the experiment. What I want you to do is put the candle, and listen carefully, because the last class had a little trouble remembering this. Um, put the candle at the end of the meter stick. Don't move it. Okay? Don't move your object. What you're going to do is move your lens. So this is fixed, 
right here. You're going to move your lens to different distances. What are you effectively changing by moving your lens around? The object distance. Now, typically when we think of changing our object distance, we would move our object, right? But it doesn't make any difference. Okay, in the end, we want the distance between the object and the lens to be a different value for each consecutive trial. It's easier to, to move the lens than it is to move the candle for a couple of reasons. One, because the candle is burning, and there's less chance of burning ourselves if we're moving something that's not on fire versus something that is. Secondly, by putting our object always at the very end, it leaves us with the rest of the meter stick to work. If I start putting my candle right here, then all of a sudden I've wasted this space on my meter stick, and I may run out of space down here on my meter stick. So leave the candle at the very end, and with each trial, place your candle, sorry, place your uh, convex lens in a different spot. But remember this, if your focal length is 10 centimeters, Always make sure your dis object distance is greater than 10 centimeters. Does that make sense? So maybe start at 15. Object distance of 15 centimeters, then 20, then 25, or whatever the case may be. You want the object distance in every trial to be greater than the focal length. The reason we want that, if DO is equal to the focal length, there is no image. If it's less than the focal length, then the image is virtual, and you're not going to project it onto the screen. So, trial one, once you get your focal length determined, let's say it's 10 centimeters, we'll then make DO 15 centimeters, let's say, right, this distance to this distance, 15 centimeters, or whatever the case may be. And then I want you to move your card back and forth until you find a focused image on the card. The flame, the, the, literally, the flame kind of bouncing around on the card. When you do, then measure this distance, whatever this distance is, between the card and the lens, and that will give me, or give you, your image distance. Record your object distance, and then record your image distance. And then for your second trial, just move your lens a little bit further down. So instead of being 15 centimeters between the candle and the lens, maybe now it's 20 centimeters between the candle and the lens. Of course, you're not going to have a focused image on your card. You're going to have to move your card somewhere else to get that focused image. And when you do, you're going to record that as your new image distance. Does that make sense? So change your object distance 10 times and see how the image distance uh, responds to that all 10 times. Just make sure that when you change that object distance, you're not moving your object, you're moving your lens, which still effectively does the same thing. Now, how do you know when you got a good, clear, sharp, focused image? Sometimes that creates a little bit of trouble for us. We see some light like this, and we think, oh, we got it, right? No, we don't. You're always going to have light going through that lens, even when the object is at the focal length and there is no image, period. You're going to have light going through the lens. It's just not going to focus. We don't want light going through the lens. We want a focused image. This is not what we want right here. This is what we want right here. Okay, we want literally the flame bouncing around because flames move a little bit, upside down. It may be smaller than the object, than the actual flame. It may be bigger depending upon where you have your object or the uh, candle placed relative to the lens, but it's going to be an upside down, real focused image on that card. So when you see this, good, you got it. Then make sure you record the distance between your lens and your screen, which will give you your image distance. So do that 10 times. Do that 10 times. Record your focal length, 10 centimeters, or whatever it happens to be. Record 10 different object distances. Record 10 different corresponding image distances. Now, you want to normally do that in centimeters. One group in the last class made a mistake and looked at the wrong side of the meter stick and measured the focal length in inches as opposed to centimeters. Is that a problem? It, as long as you do the whole experiment in inches, it actually works out. Okay, but we want to avoid doing that. We do have a lesser degree of precision if we're doing inches because the meter stick doesn't have as many, as many increments measured off on the, on, the, on the yardstick side as it does the meter stick side. So it's better doing it in centimeters, but it, it can work out if it's in inches. A, as long as you specify that you've done inches instead of centimeters, and B, as long as you're consistent through the entire experiment. All right. 
Once you've got your data table, DO and DI, object distance and image distance, then you're going to create another table, an analysis table, which is 1 over DO and 1 over DI. That's literally just taking your value and going x to the minus 1 on your calculator or on Google Sheets, saying equals 1 divided by the first cell. Literally, 1 over the number. If DO was 10, then 1 over DO would be 0 0.10. If DO was 20, then 1 over DO would be 0 0.05, and so on. Now, once you get those numbers, notice the units here, 1 over centimeters or centimeters to the minus 1. Once you get those numbers, you're going to plot a graph. And this graph is going to be somewhat like other graphs you plotted, but somewhat unlike other graphs you plotted. It's a straight line, but it's a straight line that slopes downward instead of upward. When you plot that on Google Sheets, you're going to display the equation as we always do. Okay, something, y is equal to something x plus whatever. This time, this number right here, the second number, will not be 0. That's your y-intercept, right? And for everything else that we've done this year so far, the y-intercept has either been 0 or really, really close to 0. It will be important this time. We can't just drop the y-intercept. Clearly, it go, it's not 0, right? Clearly, it goes through the y-axis somewhere other than the origin. So let's go through that analysis uh, as to how we figure out what the slope and the y-intercept mean. Um, we will do, and pay very close attention, because we will do another lab next week, likely Tuesday, um, where you have to do this analysis yourself, or I'm not going to help you with it, okay? You're just going to figure it out yourself. So pay really close attention and ask me questions today if you have them so that you're able to do this yourself next week. Okay, what's our first step? We got our straight line graph. What's our first step? Been a little while since we've done this, right? Come up with an equation. Kelly? Yeah, from, from this graph, y is equal to mx plus b. You want to say y is 1 over di. m is the slope. x is 1 over do. And then b, usually we cross that off, but this time we can't because it's not 0, so we have to include that. Our b is our y-intercept, of course, where it goes through the y-axis. And then what? Once we've got the equation for the graph, then what? Yeah, we've got to get an equation from our data sheet or, or derive one or something, but usually it comes from your data sheet. In this case, it would be 1 over f is equal to 1 over do plus 1 over di. We want to make it look as much as possible like this one, so let's rearrange it to take the same form. Um, 1 over di ends up being equal to I'm going to say negative 1 over DO, because I'm taking that over by subtracting, plus 1 over F. Now, you may have thought, well, why wouldn't I just say 1 over F minus 1 over DO? The reason I did that is because of the order of this, right? I've got 1 over DI, 1 over DO, and B. I want 1 over DI, 1 over DO, and whatever's left over. Let's start crossing things off. 1 over di disappears. 1 over do disappears. What am I left with? What am I left with? The slope is equal to what? Good. The slope is equal to negative 1. That will not be important for you because your data, although it's going to look dramatically different than your data, the slope for both of them is going to be negative 1. Or, I mean, you may find, because it's real data, that it's negative 1.01 or negative 0 0.99 or something like that, right? But theoretically, it's going to be negative 1. If you get a number that's dramatically off of negative 1, you've made a mistake. You should check your work. Now, the important thing is this, the y-intercept. And the reason that's the important thing is because the y-intercept is equal to 1 over f, right? 1 over do plus b, 1 over do plus 1 over f. So B, the y-intercept, is 1 over F. Now, what we're going to do here is rearrange that to solve for F. 
1 over the y-intercept. You've measured f. Now you've calculated f. This is your, what we would consider to be your actual value. Do a percent difference calculation. Actual value, whatever you just got for f, minus your theoretical value, which is what you got in the first place, divided by theoretical times 100. If those two numbers are, sorry, that number for percent difference is less than 10%, you've just verified the thin lens equation, right? The assumption that you made that 1 over f is equal to 1 over do plus 1 over di is valid is, in fact, correct. So that thin lens equation was verified. If it's greater than 10%, then, all right, then you've just disproven the thin lens equation, which is, I don't know, maybe Nobel Prize worthy. If you do it right, that is. Haven't made any mistakes, then you might get some kind of prize. And of course, you do have to include your conclusion as well. Is the thin lens equation for a thin converging lens? Yes or no? And how do you know? Well, I'll just briefly explain the analysis that you went through. Right? And then, of course, your sources of error. Uh, in addition to those sources of error, we want suggestions for improvement. Suggestions for improvement or things that you have already done to improve it, right? I've always told you that uh, I don't want you to, to leave something that could be better if you recognize it right now. Like, fix it. And then in your suggestion for improvement, just say, oh, I fixed it by doing this. And that's, that's better in my mind than saying, oh, this was a problem. Next time, I'll do this. It's better to say, oh, I caught it ahead of time, and I fixed it by doing this. So what do you got to hand in for this? By next Tuesday at the end of the day, problem, variables, data, analysis, conclusion, sources of error. We don't have hypothesis in there. We don't have uh, procedure in there. And we don't have materials in there. So we're missing those three things. All right.